All right, welcome. I, I, I think I'm introducing myself. So hi, I'm Curtis. Uh, and I want to, it was a, just, this was a test to see who the hardiest people at the, the conference were. Those who would sit outside without air conditioning and walk the hill before that. So congratulations, you win. Which is good because it really is a test to see who really wants to be an apostle. So um, now that I know that I got the, I, I've got the people that have been inspired by the talks this morning about trusting God and his loving mercy, uh, we can get going. I, what I'd like to do is, uh, we've got an hour and 15 minutes. I'm thinking probably going 40, 45 minutes to do some Q&A afterwards, and then we'll have a little bit of a break so you can uh, march back down the hill before the next session. And, uh, but I'm happy to stick around uh, until maybe four or five minutes before the next session begins on a smaller level if you have more questions. And why don't we go ahead and begin a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, you are a loving, merciful God, and you have loved us since you created us. Even before each of us were created, we were created in your mind. You, you had the thought of us long before we were conceived in our mother's wombs. We were conceived in your mind. And you love the idea of us. So much so that even when sin wounded us and we turned our back on you through our own personal sin, your, your love did not diminish in any way, shape, or form. But rather, you sent your son to live amongst us and, and not just teach, but to model the way to live as a faithful son so that we as sons and daughters could imitate him in all things. We entrust this time to you, and we pray not only for ourselves, but for family members and loved ones and for the church in a whole who is experiencing a tremendous crisis and trial right now. Lord, that you would bring many people to conversion, including ourselves to deeper level of conversion, that you'd heal and restore our family members back to the full practice of the faith. We entrust ourselves to you through the care of your mother as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Francis, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What I'd like to try to do is I have a general theme, and then we're going to narrow in, as I said at the introduction last night, on two basic themes. And so the idea is that Jesus doesn't just teach us in what he says. Uh, good teachers do that. They say good things and they teach people. But Jesus teaches us, as, as the church teaches us at Vatican II, through words and deeds. He both tells us but also shows us. In fact, God does this throughout salvation history with events, with people, and with the things that are taught, more, never more so than with Jesus. And I would argue that in some ways, Jesus' model has been somewhat overlooked in our modern church and would be, we'd be well served to return to his model. Now, we can do many things uh, in, in following Christ, but I want to direct our gaze to two areas. Two areas where in the last 22 years I've seen more fruitfulness, uh, more effectiveness, where I've seen in my own personal life, as I've, as I've watched what God has been doing in the lives of, first of all, you know, dozens and then hundreds and thousands and then tens of thousands of young people, and there's patterns that, that arise, and then how I've tried to take that back into my own personal life and say, well, if that's the pattern, if I were to imitate Christ in this pattern, would it bear more fruit? And I've watched hearts and minds that were, that were cool or even closed kind of melt, and to be able to see this is truly effective. And, I, I, and so I'm going to boil it down. There's many, many things you could learn, and I'll talk tomorrow in our plenary session from a different perspective. There's many things we could learn and, and imitate Christ. Some of them we probably can't, and I say that with my dear friend and esteemed, uh, I won't say colleague because she's far beyond me, but Mary Healy's in the back over there, uh, biblical scholar. But not all of us are going to be called to do extraordinary things for God. But we are called to do ordinary things extraordinarily well. We see this in St. Therese's The Little Way. And we'll talk more about that, but I want to look at two things. I want to look primarily that Jesus lived a radical uh, ministry of presence. He made himself present in a crazy sort of way. Not only did the eternal son become man, that's crazy, but then the way he lived with intentionality with a few in order to reach the whole world, also amazing kind of counterintuitive, particularly in this modern world, we're quick to say, hey, let's get a web page, or we'll do some television, or we'll fly all over the world, and we'll go big. And Jesus could have been born right now. He could have been born whenever he wanted. He was born, as we're told in Galatians, at the fullness of time, the perfect time. And he, the time he chose didn't have any of those things. And, uh, and nothing wrong with any of those things at all. I would say it's, the modern spiritual warfare is kind of like modern warfare. 
you can't possibly win without air supremacy. But, it's, but battles are actually won on the ground. Eyeball to eyeball. And, and it's even more so true for a spiritual warfare because we're not fighting against the people we disagree with. We're fighting for them. We're trying to win them, not beat them. And in order to do that, you need to get into their lives and you have to let them know that they're loved before they agree with us. We're told in scripture that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so there's this a crazy ministry of presence. And I would argue that not only did he model that uh, in history, but, but he still models it today. And the second piece is going to be, and I, I think many of you will, will be able to resonate with that. You're at a Catholic conference, many of you for more than the first time, and, and there will, I'll kind of leave an action point with each of these two items, and they'll be simple. But this first one may not require a whole lot of change in your life. Second one might a little bit, because we're going to talk a little bit about how Jesus taught and, and why I think it's so important. And the way Jesus taught was as a storyteller. Jesus tell stories over and over and over again. And I would argue that the greatest storytellers in the history of creation are the members of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And they, they, they're just the best storytellers throughout all of, of time until about the last 50, 60 years. And Madison Avenue and Hollywood tell stories better than we do right now, which is too bad because we still have the best story. And we'll talk about that. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that piece because I think it's going to be a little bit more novel to you. Um, just so, so that we can set up the urgency of what we're talking about. And I'm here to present hope. I'm going to be with you for 40 minutes or so, as I said, and I'm going to spend about uh, 45 seconds on the bad news, just so we know that we're up against a challenge. There's about a 20% chance today that if you raise your child Catholic, they're going to be a practicing Catholic by the time they're 25. Uh, or if you're, if, it's, if you're already through that phase, there's about a 20% chance that your children are going to raise your grandchildren to be practicing Catholics. And that's a devastating stat to recognize that, that this is, uh, the church doesn't operate like this. We are going through a crisis of faith that's unprecedented. And, uh, and, but don't despair because God created you and, and, and timed your existence on earth to be here right now. You were literally created to walk through this crisis. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be comfortable, but it does mean that it's going to be amazing. I think of Martin Luther King Jr. If there had not been a civil rights crisis, you would not have ever heard of it, and neither would have I. It was the unbelievably uncomfortable, problematic, unjust circumstances that he was born into and then chose to try to live faithfulness to Christ and to walk into that. And I'm not here to judge the pros or cons of Martin Luther King Jr. I'm saying he became a great man because he, he was stepped into an injustice. And if that's true of Martin Luther King Jr., how much more of Jesus Christ, who walked into the most unjust situation, the reign of Satan in the world, and, and allowed him, himself to be proven to be the greatest of all time by doing the greatest thing at the hardest place. And so this is a call to action for us, but to recognize that it's not just that we're not keeping our Catholics, we're actually hemorrhaging Catholics. For every one Catholic that joins the Catholic Church, usually at Easter, six people leave the Catholic Church. And so we are in an unsustainable hemorrhage at this point in time, and I'm, I'm done with the bad news, because I wanna tell you there's a solution for this, and it's simple, and it's not easy, but it's simple. Everybody here can do this, um, but it involves changing our habits, and changing habits are, uh, are hard. Years ago, I, I uh, was, was working on a book, and I would take breaks, and, uh, and I would see late-night television commercials for this thing called the Bowflex. And, uh, and, and, and when I first saw the Bowflex, I said, there's no way I'm going to buy that. And, and then, uh, you know, but three or four times a week, I saw the commercial for the Bowflex, and I realized those people are in better shape than I am. And, um, and I said, but I'm still not going to buy it. And then I probably saw the commercial 20 or 30 times, and I thought, I mean, I could buy it, uh, uh, you know. And, and, then I, and then I finally saw it 40, 50, 60 times, and I bought it. But you know what? That's not enough. You actually have to use it. So I can, I can sell you the Bowflex today, but you have to change your habits, and that's the hard part. It's simple, and, and, and I'm not going to ask you to do anything that's painful, but we have to change our habits. And I want, to, I want to liken what we're talking about in the new evangelization as to lighting a fire and then spreading the fire. Because I think that evangelization of the world is a lot like that. And the first step is you have to light the fire. 
If I was out lost in the woods with a couple friends of mine, and we realized the sun is starting to go down, we have no matches, no lighter, so we're like, okay, we're going to have to rub sticks together. Never done this before, but I've seen it. And I, and, and I start rubbing sticks together. I'm on the first shift, and I'm rubbing and rubbing, and, and my buddy walks over and says, he walks up with this handful of sticks. He said, I, I found more wood. Like, awesome. Um, and then he comes back a little bit later, and he goes, I found even more wood, and I'm still now, I'm sweating, and, and a little bit of smoke, but nothing going on. And at one point in time, as he brings the fourth or fifth pile of sticks, I'm going to say, we don't need any more more sticks right now. What I need you to do is take over for me because my arms are falling off. Because we need flame. But here's the cool thing. Once you have flame, you don't have to rub the sticks together anymore. Now you have a different problem. Now you need sticks. But if you try to solve the stick problem first, you'll never get there. The, the sequence is really important. You got to get the fire first, and then you're going to spread it. So I have one habit, simple habit, of how to ignite fire, and another one of how to spread fire. And Jesus himself said, I have come, in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and would that it were already kindled. This sense of fire. And, and building upon that theme, uh, St. Catherine of Siena, one of my favorite quotes of all saints, says this. The first time I heard it, I was like, okay, this is a life motto. And I, 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 I've shared this quote with college students for more than a decade. And she said, and this is true of each one of us, if you are what you were meant to be, you would set the world on fire. If you are what you were meant to be, you would set the world on fire. And to recognize that this is true, and Jesus knows that about us, that's why he's willing to give his life for us, because if we were to become who we were meant to be, which is why he created us, and then we were to live like that, we'd set the world on fire, and oh, by the way, we'd also go to heaven, and we'd probably take a whole bunch of people with us. And while we can talk about Christianity as a life improvement program, and it is, I have a better life because I'm a Christian. I married a woman who's faithful to me. I've been faithful to her. I don't cheat on my taxes. I haven't been put in prison because I don't break the laws. Well, sometimes when I'm battling against abortion, I, I, I break laws that are unjust. But I don't break laws that would get me put in prison. And so I haven't spent much time in prison. I actually have a better life. I actually have friends who are honest and generous. And, and honest people always make better friends than dishonest. So there is a life improvement piece, but that's completely secondary. All that matters in Christianity is going to heaven. That's, that's the key. It's heaven or hell. As, as Cardinal Newman said, about to be canonized, everyone who ever lived still does, somewhere. And that's all that matters. And to be able to recognize, we have to, to see that this is actually worth the effort because we're playing for all the marbles. And sure, it's great to have these other things, to have a nice life, but as Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, then all these things will be added on to you. To have these things and not have his kingdom and his righteousness makes us a cosmic failure. And to be able to recognize we've got to get this. And that's true, we, we have our church, I believe, who um, need the members of the church to be set on fire, beginning with me. And it's, it's not a one and done, the times that we have this enemy, the devil, who when we're not looking likes to put our fire out. And he does it with lots of ways. Uh, Jesus talks about a, a few of them. When he talks about the parable of the soils, and he says we get, we get concerned about the things of the world and distracted with the anxieties, and we begin to lose our fruitfulness. And if we're not careful, our flame will go out. Mary's dear friend and partner and, and my friend Peter Herbeck said to me years ago something that when I first heard it was bone chilling, but I actually, the more I thought about it, I said I knew it was true of me, at least a part in my life. He said, Curtis, I believe that the vast majority of Catholics are in a loveless marriage with God. And I thought, you know, we, as Catholics, we really are married. We're in covenant with God. We've been baptized. We're in covenant. But I, I talk to Catholics a lot, and, and when I talk to them, uh, they, they look like they've been playing basketball for an hour, and they're tired. So you say, you know, how's it going being Catholic? And they'll, they'll kind of grab their knees and start breathing heavy and go, oh. <laughs> so it's really hard. It's always Lent. You know, and, and it's... it's um, it, 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 there's this heaviness to be able to, and, and it's not supposed to be that way. It doesn't mean there won't be difficulties in being Catholic. But in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, one of the shortest parables, shortest stories in the scriptures, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found, and he hid it. And for joy over it, he went and sold all that he had so he could buy the field. In, in in this situation, the joy comes before the selling. But I think a lot of Catholics I meet, the selling comes before the joy. Well, if I could just be better, if I could just give up more, I, I would eventually be happy. And they kind of view our Catholic faith as cosmic fire insurance. 
And I'm talking to one young guy. How's, how's your faith going? Oh, it's really hard. Are you going to leave? No. Why not? Oh, I don't want to go to hell. Which, which is a good reason not to leave, but it's not the best reason to stay. And, and, and so to be able to recognize, we as a church will be the kind of people who can set fires if we ourselves are living from a place of encounter. And I want to talk about where that can happen. And it, it can happen in all sorts of ways. There are thousands of ways to encounter Christ. And what do I mean by encounter? I mean to have this aha moment where all of a sudden, the God we know, we all of a sudden know his love is real, it's personal, it's, it's, it's not something that's purely historical. Maybe you've seen the play or the movie Fiddler on the Roof. In the movie, the, the main character has three daughters and they refuse to accept the arranged marriages and want to marry guys they want to be in love with. And he married a woman, Tevye married a woman who he was arranged in. And after he watches the third daughter, refused to take an arranged marriage, he's like, well, they all want to marry people they're in love with. And he turns to his wife and says, sings the song, Do You Love Me? And she responds, well, for 25 years, I've cooked your food and washed your clothes. What do you mean? And three or four times, he says, but, yeah, but do you love me? And she goes back to the practical stuff that's involved in marriage. And at the end of the song, she says, yeah, I suppose I do. And all of a sudden, she says, I love you for the first time in 25 years. And I know when I told my wife, Michael Ann, we weren't married at the time, when I told my uh, soon-to-be fiancé, Michael Ann, for the first time that I loved her, I, it had to have been true before I said it, or I would have been lying when I said it, right? But when you say it, something changes. And for us to be I love you type Catholics, I will follow you, Lord, anywhere. I will do whatever you want me to do. I will say whatever you want me to say. When we as a church live like that, we will be on fire, and then we can talk about spreading the fire. So where does that happen? Where does this encounter occur? I mean, it happens all over the place. God can meet you anywhere. It could be through a tragedy. It could be through nature. It could be through the sacraments. It could be through reading scripture. It could be through serving the poor. And I've watched over the last uh, 22 years as tens of thousands of college students have encountered Christ and come back and said, this is my story. It's, it's, it's diverse and wonderful, but I will say there's a pattern. Without a doubt, there's one activity that has been more fruitful than any of the other activities. And I don't say this to disparage any of the other activities. They're all great. But I will say, in our experience, sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, exposed, is the most fruitful way to ignite a fire. Our staff spend a holy hour every day, in addition to Mass and Divine Mercy Chapel and other things that they're doing, to sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament, when possible, exposed. Because there's something about sitting and looking at this apparent wafer of bread and having to do the faith act of, yeah, but I, I see what I think is bread, but I'm actually looking at you. There's something amazing about the way that reality happens. We've watched thousands and thousands of young people. We hold a conference every year. Mary has spoken at it. And, uh, and we, we hold this conference, and we bring some of the best speakers in the country. Scott Hahn speaks, Ted Sree speaks, Mary Healy speaks. We've got great speakers. I mean, we try to pride ourselves in trying to find the very best, most engaging speakers we can find. And we, we do a survey at the end of the conference and rate all the activities. And Jesus beats the speakers. It's so cool. And he doesn't do anything. He just sits there <laughs> pretend, pretending to look like bread. And thousands, of, it's, it's amazing to think what happens. So, so you sit there. I was with a friend who had never been before, and, and adoration began. And on this particular evening, there were probably 10,000 people there. And, uh, and about 20 minutes after Jesus exposed, hundreds of people got up and left. And he goes, why are they leaving? I said, they're not leaving. They're going to confession. And we had hundreds of priests over at the side and, and literally thousands of young people going to confession. Last year, we were down in Indianapolis and, and thousands of people had over 6,500 confessions heard and uh, it was amazing to watch. And, and, and as this is going on, one of the cameramen says, hey, I need to take a bathroom break. And so they, 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 and he gets over, the, the, the backup cameraman comes up, he says, I'm, I'm kidding, I just need to go to confession. I haven't been in years. And to be able to sit back and say, we had, a, we had a policeman who was there for security, and he said, can I do this next year? I hadn't been to confession in 10 years, and I went. And to be able to watch Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament, and then the ability to get to confession, that, we believe, is the best way. There's, there's, it's up to God how it's going to work in your life or in your family member's life. Don't port force God to work. I'm just saying the pattern we see 
is that adoration, and that's my invitation to you, that you would increase the amount of time you're, you're spending in front of the Blessed Sacrament because you have to be on fire more than you are today to be able to impact your others. And then when you have the chance to bring people, bring them to a place where they can sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Because one of the things I love about what happens when you put people in front of the Blessed Sacrament and they're moved to sit, and this was true for me, as I, as I went to adoration for the first time in many, many years, not practicing my Catholic faith, and I looked at the, at the host, and I knew enough Catholic theology to know that Catholics thought that was Jesus. But I wasn't sure it was Jesus. But I wasn't sure it wasn't Jesus. In my mind, I'm thinking about all the scripture passages I know, and you know, this is my body, and you must eat my flesh. And I'm like, those all sound very, very Catholic. And I'm not a Catholic Christian right now. And uh, I, I felt compelled. There's, there's no kind of middle ground. Either it is Jesus, and I should fall on my knees, maybe on my face, or it's not Jesus and I should get out of the room and try to get the other people out of the room also because they're worshiping bread. Uh, there's no middle ground. And it led me on a two-year journey uh, to, to come back to the Catholic Church of praying and reading and discovering the church fathers and, and, and pouring over scriptures and finally going to confession. But what the priests tell me uh, about the focus conference, about the adoration event, is that um, they, this is so beautiful. I said, I, obviously we can't tell you what we heard, but I will tell you, these are the confessions I became a priest to hear. It's not, I was angry with my sister, or uh, somebody cut me off on the highway and, and, and I yelled. Uh, these are, I'm dead in sin, and I want to come home. Would you please give me new life? And so I want to encourage you if, you, if you already have the habit of spending time in front of the Blessed Sacrament, um, then maybe it's adding five more minutes. If you're already praying a half hour a day or, or, or more, then it's probably beginning to pray, God, who do you want me to bring to sit here with me? One of the things that we've, we've done, and I saw this model for me with Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn, when I was here in graduate school in the 90s, did not tell me that I should make holy hours. He said, what, what are you doing tomorrow at 6 o'clock in the morning? And we went and made holy hours together. He didn't tell me what to do. He showed me what to do. And to be able to sit back and say, you can invite people, but let, let God put them on your heart. I know you're going to think mostly about your kids and grandkids, but he may want to put them on somebody else's path. And you may have somebody that's on their list that you need to sit. Whose relationship do you have that you could invite? And, and to not tell them what to do, but to invite them to walk with you. And so to be able to be committed to adoration, whatever that might be, that's the, the starting of the fire, that I would let, Lord, your fire burn in my heart, my mind, my soul to the greatest degree possible. And that I would, I would manifest that by coming to you in, the, in, in adoration and then in, inviting other people as well. All right, so it, now if we can, uh, that's the first habit. And like I said, many of you are already praying. And for some of it's a prayer every day. And now it's just saying, well, you know what? I could actually spend an extra seven minutes and drive to church and pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Even if it's just once a day. You're praying every day, but you're, but you're going to get to the church once a week. Um, the key thing here is not how much you're praying. It has to probably be at least seven, eight, ten minutes, enough to quiet down. And, uh, and I, I would argue probably 15, 20 minutes better than that, but the, the amount's not important. The consistency. The consistency. If I sit back and say, hey, I, I've got this great diet, and I'm on it uh, one day a month, <laughs> that, that doesn't work. It's the consistency that's more important than the specifics. And so I want to encourage you on that. The other one is actually something, uh, much of what we're talking about today and tomorrow is in the book Making Missionary Disciples, which is in the bookstore, and it really is what we've learned in the last 21 years. This was written a year ago. We're now in our 22nd year. What did we learn, and what are those repeatable habits? How can we imitate Christ in word and deed? You know, Jesus prayed in front of his apostles so many times that they finally said, teach us how to pray. He didn't teach them how to pray first. He modeled it first and then later taught. We live in a church that tends to teach first if we model it all. And, and we need to change that because the, the, the first term for Christianity was the way. It was a way of living, not just a set of teachings. And I believe, and I hope you do too, I believe all the teachings. I believe them all. They're absolutely necessary, but they're not sufficient. There's more than teachings to being a Catholic. And so the second piece is actually something that's, that's new to me that uh, really about, maybe about a year ago, I have the honor of serving the U.S. bishops on their committee for evangelization. Bishop Barron is the chair, and uh, it's an honor to serve. I, I serve Archbishop Shapu on the, on the committee for the laity as well, and I love Archbishop Shapu. He's been the closest thing to a spiritual father of any priest in my life, 
He used to be the Archbishop of Denver, and that's where I live. He was my spiritual director for a decade. Um, but I like Bishop Barron's committee meeting better because Bishop Barron brings experts in every time to teach the bishops and the others that are on the committee best practices. And so it's exciting because you learn something every time you go. And so it's, it's always fun. And the way it works is the, it's a hierarchy. So the bishops all sit at one end of the table, and then the staff who work for them sit in the middle of the table, and then the consultors sit at the end of the table, kind of with a tail. The head's up there, the tail's down here. But when the experts come in, they sit at the tail. So they're right next to me. So I get to talk to them during the breaks. I've learned a lot of fun things, but there's been one that has changed the way I think about things maybe more than uh, anything else that I've heard in the two years that I've served on the committee. Christian Smith, who is a sociologist out of Notre Dame, really, really solid guy, written a number of books. He has a book coming up, which I'm going to talk about. And it's a, it, you can order it on, a, on uh, on Amazon, but it's actually not out quite yet. But it's, the cover is done. It'll be out within a few weeks. Uh, and you don't need to get the book because I'm going to tell you the, the main thing right now. Um, and and uh, it's, it's so critical. So he's talking to the bishops about his previous work, and he's probably got more insight as to what's going on with young people and the faith than anybody on earth. And, and, and from a position of faith, he's a man of deep faith. And I, I had been to talks, I'd, I'd read some of his articles, um, and I'd been to some of his talks but I'd never met him because we were always in crowds. And, uh, and he knew about focus, but he'd never met me because I'd never met him. It works that way. And, uh, and so, uh, so he gives his presentation. It's really good. And so I said, that was really good. And I, I said, I, I want to introduce myself. I'm Curtis Martin. And he goes, oh, from focus. I said, yeah. I said, I've been an admirer of your work for a long time. He goes, I love focus. You're going to love my next book. And I said, well, what? tell me about it. He said, uh, I said, I have a team of about 100 researchers. And so we found... Uh, of hundreds of families who raise children and none of those children practice their faith as adults. And we found hundreds of families and all of their children practice their faith as adults. And we asked all of those families hundreds of questions. What did you do and not do? And he said, Curtis, there was a very clear pattern. One thing rose above everything else. Every, there were things that were important. Did you have family meals together? It was important. Did you pray the rosary together? It was important. Did you take them to mass consistently? Important. But, but the most important, more important than anything else, he said, and I'm, now I'm sitting back, oh, well, that'd be great to know. And so you'll have to come to my talk tomorrow to hear that. I'm kidding. The, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, uh, he said, the families that raised children who grew up to be adults who practiced their faith had the habit of having spiritual conversations with their children on a regular basis. And I want to talk to you for the rest of our time, and the second habit will be based upon this. Um, we used to be the best storytellers in the world. Our church, uh, and before us, our Jewish brothers and sisters, the best storytellers. In fact, you can imagine, actually we're told in, in, in Genesis that Abraham was chosen by God because he would instruct his children. And you have to go back and say, there's a very real possibility that Abraham was illiterate. There were very, very few books back then. And, and so, and it, it wasn't just his children, but it, it was the people in his household. And many of them probably were not literate. There were very few books, very few people knew how to read. But Abraham would sit around the campfire at night as the patriarch and tell stories about his ancestors, about Adam and Noah and, and Shem and the great characters at that time in history. And he'd tell them what he knew about God and how God was an amazing God. I like just imagine this, this, this man leaning up the campfire and, and all the little boys and girls just listening. Tell, tell us more. Tell us another one. Have you ever had that talking to, you're telling a story to a child or a grandchild? Do one more, one more. And, uh, and there's this sense, when, when we tell stories, something changes. When we share principles, we make lists and we talk kind of officially and we point to things and say, and then the second point is that when we tell stories, we're like, okay, and then it went like this. And, and when you start to talk about a narrative, people lean in. And, and the, the Bible's filled with narratives. There are 69 chapters of narrative before the Ten Commandments. It's in Exodus chapter 20. But there's the first 50 chapters of Genesis and the first 19 chapters of Exodus are all narrative. God tells us stories before he tells us principles. We live in a church that tells us principles before they share the stories. And the problem is, is that when you only share the principles, you don't establish relationships. And there's a principle in parenting that says rules without relationship lead to rebellion. 
And we're living in a culture of rebellion. And it's because we're, we have not established relationship. And, and the, the best way to do that is to become a storyteller. Because it's not, you know, what, what happens for us right now, if you're like me, when it's Thanksgiving or Easter or Christmas, and we're supposed to get together with our family members, some of whom aren't practicing their faith anymore, we get in arguments. It's tense. At one point in time, I turned to my mother and I said, why do I, why do I consistently spend more time with non-believers on days like Christmas than I do, can we just meet on the 24th or something like that? This is, the, this is a big day for me. And, I, it, it, and we can't talk about Jesus. And, and, but we were talking about why they weren't walking with Jesus rather than about what Jesus and who he was. And you tell stories and it eliminates some of the controversy. And, and it, Dr. Shree's going to give a great talk, which I've heard before on relativism uh, in his breakout. Uh, but the key there is you don't even have to believe that King David ever lived to tell the story about David and Bathsheba and Uriah. It's still a great story. They did exist, which makes it even better. But to recognize that story does away with relativism, because I, I don't need to agree with you about the facts. I'm just going to listen to your story. We do it all the time. In fact, we do it more than any culture in the history of the world. The amount of things that we have to believe are true that aren't true to watch a movie is crazy. It's called suspending disbelief. And narrative allows us to do that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you about this because Jesus told stories. And, and, and many of those stories were historical. And, and salvation history is a long, lengthy, historical story. Ted and I wrote a book together uh, called The Real Story in which it just talks about those stories. It really is, a, there's a, the passage in the road to Emmaus. And in the passage of the road to Emmaus, uh, Jesus begins with Moses, the book of Genesis. Uh, Moses is the author of Genesis. And explains all the scriptures, so the entire Old Testament, to them and how those, those books spoke of him. And there's not a single word about what Jesus actually said. And so Ted and I try to reconstruct what he might have said, beginning with, with Adam and going forward, in a story form. Because we need to become storytellers. If we want to win our, our family's hearts, we want to win our world, we need to tell stories better. And I'd like to give an example of that. So, but before we do that, let me say the power of that. See, we mentioned earlier that the best storytellers right now are actually Madison Avenue. And uh, I, I would argue a set of not just stories, but meta-narratives. A meta-narrative is not just a story. It, it, it's a story of stories. It's a whole chain of stories, like the Star Wars is a meta-narrative. It's not just a story. It's lots and lots and lots of stories over many, many years. Salvation history is another meta-narrative. But the meta-narratives that have been told to us are Star Wars and uh, Game of Thrones and Harry Potter. And I'm not here to criticize. Don't watch the, the Game of Thrones show. But I'm not here to criticize those meta-narratives as I am as much to say they're actually meta-narratives that don't have Jesus at the center. There's no need for Jesus. If, if you believe in Jesus, you can spiritualize Star Wars, um, and, and, and there's some legitimacy to it. Obi-Wan Shinobi, the, the term Shinobi is based on Chenobite, or a monk. Um, there's some connections there, but there's no trinity at the center of the Star Wars. And the problem is if, if our young people don't know salvation history, but they do know these stories, they begin to think that the world doesn't need the trinity at the middle of it. And then we're in trouble. Because we need to teach them a, a, a story that's true so they'll recognize the world doesn't make any sense without the Trinity at the center of it, without the crucifixion in the center of our history, to be able to say that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce you to something you've probably heard of, may already do, but I'd like to put a, a little bit of a twist to it. The, the, the concept is what's called Lexio Divina. And in, in the beginning of Ted's and my book, we quote Cardinal Ratzinger, who at the time had not, or I guess he was already Pope, so we quoted Benedict XVI. And he says, Lexio Divina is the diligent reading of sacred scripture accompanied with prayer. And it brings about an intimate dialogue in which the person reading hears God who is speaking and in praying responds to him with trust. If the church were to practice this, I believe it would bring the church to a new springtime. So this is a powerful uh, idea, but I think with what I'm about to share with you, you can do this. You, what's cool is you don't have to be Scott Hahn to do what we're about to talk about. I don't know if you have this experience when you listen to Scott, but I, can, I, I get intimidated. I, I study with Scott, and, um, and, and, I, and he, he mentored me for, for seven years while I lived here. Uh, I was only in grad school for two. I had a job the other five. It didn't take me seven years. Um, and he mentored me. And, uh, but I remember my, my final semester in grad school, I had an independent study with Scott. 
and uh, he wanted me to read a thousand pages a day. And I, I, I had childhood dyslexia. <laughs> I don't read a thousand pages a year. And um, I, I got great retention, but I don't read fast at all. And I, I am, I'm reading and, and my eyeballs are bleeding. I, I just can't take it. I mean, I'm not even close. I'm getting, I'm getting into the upper hundreds, but I'm not even getting close to a thousand. I just can't read that much. I'm spending all day reading. And, I, and he's giving me books to read. And some of them are just horrible. Just like there's nothing in them. At one point in time, I walked up this big 600-page book, and I said, why did you make me read this? And Scott has a photographic memory. So Scott grabs the book, and he opens it up to page 465, and he goes, that line right there is amazing. <laughs> are you kidding me? Oh, my goodness. Why would you make me spend a week trying to just <laughs> chewing on cotton? It was just horrible. You know, but that's the, the, but it, it, the scary thing was Scott was when I was trying to read more than I'd ever read in my life, Scott was still reading more than me every day. And he's smarter than I am, so he was remembering more and, and understanding more. And it could be kind of intimidating. I'm really grateful for Scott, Hahn, but, but I actually had an argument with, uh, with a buddy of mine, Danny Abramus and I uh, did a program together called Crossing the Goal. And Danny's been a friend for a long time. He played in the NFL and coached the NFL. And about two years into working on this television program with Danny, we're having this argument. And he said... Uh, so you're telling me you'd rather have a college sophomore lead a Bible study than Scott Hahn? And I said, absolutely. Because <laughs> guess what? There's only one Scott Hahn. And we're not going to see another one. Whereas there's millions of college sophomores. And if we could get them to be able to speak clearly about the scriptures, we could set the world on fire. Now, they need the insights that Scott's giving them. Thank God for his role in the body of Christ. But if you build a system on duplicating Scott Hahn's, we're done. And, and, and so we need to recognize this is something that all of us could do. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just take a look. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to prayerfully read the scriptures. And you can time me if you want. It's going to take a couple of minutes. Um, and um, we will. And then what I want to do is I'll, I'll, these are scripture passages I read before. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it down. And I'm going to retell the story in my own words. And I, I, I found it's very important to start with the scriptures because my retelling is not the word of God. The scriptures are. So you should read the word of God first, but not a long section, a few verses, and then retell the story because there's crazy stuff. I'm going to talk about the crazy stuff Jesus did tomorrow in the plenary session. I want to talk about the crazy stuff he said um, and to some degrees did as well here, but in, in a very different way. And just look and see, we read stuff in the scriptures as faithful Catholics, and we've got this funny relationship with the Bible where we sit back and say, amen, Lord, yes, Lord. I don't understand anything I'm reading, but yes, it's your word. And because uh, there's, there's crazy stuff that should bother us. Why, why, why would you do that? So let me give you a, a couple of examples. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. And uh, this is the, this, you know this passage well. This is what's so fun about what we're doing is that when you start practicing Lexio, and I, when you do Lexio, you can do this with all the scriptures. But I would encourage you to do Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, repeat. And do those five books at least three times before you do anything else. Because you're going to find Jesus more clearly in these books than any place else. And then once you have done this for a while, and it takes, it takes months, because you, you might read one section for two weeks. Because you're chewing on it going, I, don't, I, I think I found something I don't understand, but I, I don't know the answers to it. And you'll, you'll pray through it for a few days or even a week, and then you'll sit back and go, i got to go find a commentary because I don't know why this is here. And then you go, look, don't start with a commentary. Wrestle with it a little bit on your own. Because the commentaries will, will, will short-circuit it. You actually want to be in a place where you're like, I don't understand. St. Augustine said, God put difficulties in the scriptures so that we come back to them again and again and again. You can't say, oh, yeah, I read that. No, you've you got to read it again and again. So you know this passage. If you're starting your uh, clock, you can start it now. And Jesus saw two boats by the lake. This is Luke chapter 5, verse 2 and following. And Jesus saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them, and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great shoal of fish and as their nets were breaking, they beckoned to their partners in the other boat who came to help them. And they came and filled both boats. And, they, and the boats began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, 
I'm a sinful man. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. Henceforth, you will be catching men. That's the end of the reading. So if you're, like, I've got kids at home, uh, uh, five kids at home still. We have been blessed with nine. And sometimes when I say we're going to do something religious, they, the, the teenagers will go, <sighs> right? You're know, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be really, really uh, fair and, and only ask a little bit of time. Because what, what happens is the discussion that's going to come from this may last longer, but now they've chosen to stick around. But we're, we're, we're actually, I'm, I'm done with the first part, took, what, less than two minutes. Now I'm going to tell it, and, and that's going to take another uh, two or three minutes. And, uh, and then there's, there's room for discussion, and sometimes the discussion happens, and sometimes it doesn't. But if, if you take this time, so I might read that passage, and I have read that passage, sometimes uh, every, week, every day for two or three weeks. And, and I'll share another one with you when we're done with this, just this kind of reading. I'm going to read slowly. I'm not trying to get through the scriptures. I'm not trying to finish the chapter. I just want to, I want to, I want to percolate on what's going on in front of me and say, are there some things that are in here that, that are unusual? Because we're told by Vatican II and, and the tradition of the church that every word is exactly as it ought to be. There's not, there's not a word in here that, the, that shouldn't be. There's not a word missing. It's exactly as it ought to be. So whether there's something missing, why? And whether there's something added that just doesn't quite need to be there. It either raises a question, you sit back and say it's an unnecessary piece of data at first glance. So I would say it this way. So some fishermen had gone out from washing their nets. They were done fishing, they washed their nets. It's kind of interesting to know, because if you've been doing this for a while, I also know that you know, Peter is a professional fisherman. He's only mentioned going fishing twice, and both times he fishes all night and catches nothing. So you get the idea that he's not a very good fisherman, which I don't think is true. But talk about, you know, let me, uh, you're going to tell that story again, aren't you, Lord? And uh, my wife likes to tell the story of when we first met, started dating, because I'm five years older than she is, and she likes to make a big deal about that. And so I, when she starts on the story, I'm like, here we go again. And, uh, but it's like, you're not a very good fisherman all the time, are you? And uh, so anyway, he's, the deal is um, Jesus sees them. They've been up all night. It, Peter's probably frustrated. He's tired. Might be a little grumpy, at least tempted to be grumpy. And he's doing the thing that fishermen don't really love to do, but you have to do it because your nets are your livelihood. He's washing his nets. Why he washed his nets, I'm not quite sure. He didn't catch anything. They weren't dirty. But anyway, he's washing his nets. And so he's, he's, they're doing it. It's a, it's a kind of a tedious task at the end of fishing if you've had a good day or night. It's a really frustrating task if you've had a bad day or night. And so Jesus says, can I use the boat? Can we put out just a little bit? And, and so Peter's kind of probably huffing and puffing a little bit, or I would be, and, and Jesus is given a teaching, and, and, and it's not recorded what he said. And so I, it, how long he talked, we don't really know. He just said when he was done, he said, let's go out into the deep. And, and my thought, my first thing that strikes me is, do you think Jesus knew that he was going to tell Peter to go fishing when he first got there? Of course he did. He's God. So why did he not say, hey, hold off on washing the nets? <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation where you feel like God's asking you to do something, it doesn't make any sense. He's always allowing you to do something, and it's not bearing any fruit. And, uh, and that's one of these situations right here. He does it all the time, all the time. He asks us to do crazy, crazy things, or, or, or just allow us to do crazy things and not correct us. He knew he was going to go fishing pr pretty much exactly when he finished washing the nets, right? Now it's time to go fishing. <laughs> and, and there's obviously some trust because Peter says, Master, so he, he's got some sense of trust. That's a whole different talk. I think probably his, his brother, Andrew, and, and uh, had, we were pretty sure from John chapter 1, had met Jesus earlier at his baptism. John, uh, Andrew, Peter's brother, was a disciple of John the Baptist. And if you're in my mind, you sit back and say, well, they read his baptism, and, and they said, we want to follow you. And he said, great, I need to spend 40 days in the wilderness. You go home, and I'll come get you. And so 40 days later, he shows up, and Andrew's like, that's the guy, that's the guy. Let him use your boat, let him use your boat. And, and Peter's like, well, whatever. Just want to finish my nets. And, uh, and now he's like, okay, master, if, if the story's right, you're a carpenter, not a fisherman. What are we doing? And then, and then he catches the best catch of his entire life, a professional fisherman, best. And, and you, know, you know what he said. I mean, he said exactly what I would have said. He says, this is amazing. We should go in the fishing business together, Right? <laughs> I mean, why, why would you not do that? I mean, I would just this is great. It's your first day, so we'll call it Curtis and Jesus Fishing. Um, no, 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 no. I, I can see where this is going. We'll call it Jesus and Curtis uh, Fishing. And, and I think that if you had said that or I had said that, I think that Jesus would have said, yeah, see, I don't want to be your partner. 
I want to be the Lord of your life. I want you to quit your job and I want you to sell everything you have and come follow me. And, and my question for you is, have you ever had a quit your job moment with God? Because that's one of those encounters. He, doesn't, he, he may not ask you to quit your job, but have you ever been to the point where like, I would quit my job if you told me to? Um, and to sit back and say, actually following you is just more important than anything and everything. And, and, and I'm done with that. That's the, that's the retelling. So that was probably, what, three minutes, three and a half? And, and, and when you know the story well enough that you can actually retell it and you see a few things and they're like, why would he let him wash his nets? Why would Peter fall down and say, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, instead of why don't we go in the fishing business together? And then isn't it odd that, that Peter walks away from the greatest catch? He doesn't even start to clean the fish. And it's not just Peter, it's Andrew, his brother, and it's not just Peter and Andrew, it's James and John, their partners. Four of the 12 apostles are called right here. And they literally walk away from the best catch of their professional careers and don't clean or prepare a single fish. They look at their elderly fathers and say, I, I got to go. And Jesus said, you got to love me more than you love your mother or your father. You're not worthy of me. And see, when you've sat and paused and sit like that and you ask people like, What's, so have you ever had a quit your job moment? And, you know, most nine-year-olds haven't. But you start, you start to, I watch this now because we, we, I learned this a little while ago and I shared it with my wife and she said, we need to start doing this. So on Sundays, we do this. In fact, for the summer, we've been trying to do it every, every evening, just right after dinner, five, seven minutes. And you know what? They've never said, uh, no, I don't want to do it. It's, it's kind of like, hey, do you know, can you tell me another story? And I, and I believe if we were to do this and start to have spiritual conversations with our loved ones, you would draw them to the heart of the faith and they would catch fire and be able to spread it and to be able to recognize this is how we keep people Catholic and draw them back into the faith. Not to tell them, you know what, when's the last time you went to Mass? I'm really disappointed you're not going to Mass. Yeah, you know what, I hate this conversation. And, and we feel obliged to do it, but I actually don't think, while we should be obliged to try to win them back, the key thing there is win them back, not, not lecture them back. It hardly ever works. And it's really hard not to because it's the most important thing to us, right? I mean, I've told my, my, my kids right before my, my first son got married, I said, you know, we, we want to pull back the curtain a little bit. The, the whole project here is for you to get to heaven and to take our grandkids who don't exist yet into heaven. It's why we've done everything. Not always well, but it's why we did everything. And we want to invite you on the other side of the table now to be part of the solution here. And I'm honored to say that we're four for four so far. Two of our four are missionaries of focus, and, uh, and, and they're on mission with us, all of them. But to be able to see... To, to have these spiritual conversations, not about the church crisis. Some of us need to talk about that some of the time. Maybe all of us have to talk about it a little bit of the time. But you don't win souls to Christ and to the church by talking about the crisis or expressing frustration. But when you tell the great stories of Jesus Christ, the great stories of the Old Testament patriarchs and of the New Testament and New Covenant saints, you light people up. St. Ignatius of Loyola was wounded in battle was almost killed by a cannonball, and all there was was a Bible and the lives of the saints. And he started reading the stories and started to have spiritual conversations, at first in his own imagination, and then, in, and then with, in prayer, and then he sat back and said, oh my goodness, I've been serving an earthly king and almost died. These people serve a heavenly king. I want to spend the rest of my life serving him. He had a quit my job moment and founded the Jesuits. And to be able to recognize that. And it's interesting that when Ignatius of Loyola was founding the Jesuits, his young Jesuits would gather around him, and when he would give their, their assignments and they'd end their meetings, it always ended the same way. He would always turn at the end of the meeting and say, go set the world on fire. St. Catherine Siena, if you are what you were meant to be, you would set the world on fire. St. Ignatius, go set the world on fire. Jesus Christ, oh, I've come to set fire to the earth, and I wish it was already kindled. And, and we're playing for all the marbles to be able to recognize this. We are, I'm going to do one more very quickly just to show you that this can be done anywhere. And again, you can time me if you want. Uh, the setting is this. Always good to know the context uh, of where you are. I'll be brief. Uh, this is the day after Jesus gets baptized in John chapter 1. It says, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. That's John the Baptist. With two of his disciples. It becomes explicit that Andrew is one of them. Um, and, and he looked at, at Jesus as he walked by and pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, 
come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying. And it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm done reading. I'm going to retell. So one of the things that Lexio invites you to do is kind of get your imagination engaged. And, and to sit back and say, what was this kind of like? Just as I did before, that Peter might have been frustrated or grumbling or, or, or you know, tired or, or why or puzzled at why Jesus would wait until he was done washing his nets to say, let's go fishing. And in this one, I think it's kind of interesting. It's, it's the day after Jesus is baptized, which is kind of a crazy day, and two of John the Baptist's disciples who thought this could be the guy, they, they quit their jobs. And uh, they were younger brothers, so they probably didn't have a job because the older brothers got the job, got the business. And so they were, they were thinking, okay, we're going to find the Messiah. So they're down there listening to John the Baptist, like, this is the guy, this is the guy, this is the guy. And then one day Jesus shows up and John says, that's the guy. And they're like, oh, wow. We thought you were the guy, but you're saying he's the guy. And crazy stuff was happening. You know, he got an argument in the water, who's going to baptize who? And John lost uh, and, and, and baptized Jesus. And, uh, and the bird comes out of heaven, and there's a voice. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of crazy what's going on. And so they're wowed by Jesus, but they've been with John. And now all of a sudden Jesus is leaving and there's, there's no cell phones. You can't like ping him and find out where they are. He's walking. And if he goes over the next hill, he's gone. You, you, good luck finding him. And so they got to make this decision. Like, okay, there goes Jesus. But John, we, and no time for goodbye. Jesus is on his way. Like, oh, wow. And they start to walk. And then there, there's kind of this awkward thing where they're walking after him, right? And, 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 have you ever been walking and you think somebody's behind you and you, you kind of turn around? And in my mind, you know, Jesus is kind of walking and he turns around and, and uh, Andrew and, and John are like, <laughs> you know, and, and it happens two or three times and finally he, Jesus catches them looking at him and he says, what do you seek? And they're like, I don't know. I, there's not a script here. Where are you staying? Was that a good question? I don't know if it's a good question. And, and, and Jesus says, come and see. And, and they came and saw and it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And this passage bothered me. Because why do we need to know that it's four o'clock in the afternoon? It's 2,000 years ago. Does it really matter? Could it have been 2.30? Why does that mean? Who cares that it's four o'clock in the afternoon? It was very frustrating to me that there was this incredible detail in John chapter one. And to highlight it, and I've already mentioned this, if you literally take a pin in four o'clock in John chapter one and go back one page, you're at the end of Luke's gospel, and you're at the road to Emmaus. And Jesus gives the greatest Bible study in the history of the world and doesn't share a single word. The scriptures don't give us a single word. Oh, my goodness, I would love a little more detail here, even a couple more chapters. Nothing. Turn the page. It's 4 o'clock. Who's doing the editing in this book? <laughs> Why in the world would you want to know that? But there's got to be a reason because... the Guess who did the editing? The Holy Spirit did the editing. It's exactly what it should be. And this is one of the ones where I couldn't get it on my own. And I read it, and I read it over and over again. I probably had it for two, two and a half weeks. I'm like, what, what am I missing? And I go back and read some of the commentaries, and they said, uh, this was the moment when John's life changed. He's the author of the gospel. And um, he's, he's, at some point in time, he's, he's exiled in the island of Patmos, and uh, He's, he's a mystic, he's deep in prayer, and I don't know exactly how it happened, but in, in my imagination, he's praying and he hears, John, I want you to tell my story. And if it was me, I would have said, look, I, re I read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're awesome. I, I don't know what I'd have to add. That's just you're really, really good. Um, I, you know, I'm just going to defer. And, uh, and then, no, I want you to tell my story. And so this old man, late in life, decades removed from his life with Christ in the flesh, sits down to write. He goes back to the beginning. He's like, oh, you know what? I remember when I first met him. Andrew and I were there with John, and he got baptized. And the next day, he was walking away. And it was, it was uh, what do you seek? Where are you staying? Come and see. And we, and we did. And uh, I remember it was in the afternoon. Um, my life completely changed at that moment. It would never be the same. It was about four o'clock. And the question for you is, what's your four o'clock? Have you had those moments? Because if you haven't, God wants you to have them. So get close to the scriptures and get close to the Eucharist and the Blessed Sacrament and, and, and be able to know the love story. And if you have, foster more of them because it's not a one and done. I, I don't get to tell Michael Ann, look, I told you I loved you. I will tell you if I change my mind. 
It doesn't work that way. I, I, our, our love affair, our marriage should be an enduring love affair. And it is when it's healthy. And, and our faith is the same way. But John, at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, see, it was, it was decades later. All the other apostles, by the time he writes this, are all dead. They've all been martyred. He's the last one. He's the last one to give testimony of, of, in the Gospels. And he's reminded of his 4 o'clock. And I think uh, that framework of the 4 o'clock has been something that I've shared with college students now for five or six years is, um, is compelling. It gives you them something to think about. I've had, we've had focused missionaries who have gotten married at four o'clock in the afternoon because of this passage. And to be able to recognize this is a paradigm for me. My dad died, and I'll close with this and we can take some uh, questions. My dad died a couple years ago. He died at home and my family was surrounding him. And, and when he passed about two o'clock in the morning, we just spontaneously began to tell stories of life with dad. And we, cry, we cried and we laughed. And, uh, but what I realized is that that's, that's all the Gospels are. They're just telling stories of times with Jesus. Remember that time he gave that sermon on the mount? That was awesome. Remember, remember the time he, he forgave that woman caught in adultery? And it's just one four o'clock moment after another. There were millions of them. John says if everything was, that he said and done was written down, all the books in the world would not contain it. These are the ones that were written down. They're the best of the best. And they're written in such a way under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to provoke and, and, and enshrine the opportunity to have spiritual conversations. But for you to do it, you have to read it and know it so well that you could retell it yourselves. And here's the beautiful thing. It's not hard. It's not hard. People were doing it for centuries, and they didn't even know how to read. This is not a, you got to get a doctorate. This is a, you need to spend time in the Scripture. So my second and final action point for you is that you would begin to read the scriptures prayerfully on a daily basis, slowly, and that you would begin to pray for the opportunity to have spiritual conversations about what you're reading. Maybe on a Sunday, it's the Lord's Day. I frequently struggle with, I know we're supposed to make the Lord's Day holy. I'm not exactly sure beyond mass and, and avoiding shopping what that is. And for us to have spiritual conversations on a Sunday has been a great thing for my family. And so um, with that, I think that if we live the encounter in whatever way God wants that, but the most frequent one we've seen is, front, is in front of the Blessed Sacrament and invite others to do the same. And then if we were to prayerfully read the scriptures and learn those passages as well enough so that we could tell them ourselves, we'd be able to set hearts on fire and spread that fire throughout the world. So my invitation for you is, these two opportunities, these two actions, simple, not, not hard, except for the fact that it's a change in habit, and that as you do, my prayer for you will be that you will go set the world on fire. Love to take some questions. Yes? Great question. I'll answer it, then I'll try to answer you. I'm going to answer it a little bit different. Then if I don't satisfy you, I'll come back and answer it directly. I'm a big believer in immersion experiences. So it's one thing to invite somebody to go down the street and, and, and go to the church and pray with you one-on-one. -on -one. It's another thing to invite them, as we do, on a mission trip for a week and have adoration every day there, or to come for a five-day conference and be surrounded by thousands of other people that are also there. Because getting people out of their ordinary life is really important. Jesus, one of the things we didn't talk about, he does crazy things. If I wanted to tell you about the, the arch in, in St. Louis, I would, I just did. There's an arch in St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> Jesus would say, let's go for a walk. And he'd walk to St. Louis. It would be crazy, but he did it all the time. He would be up in Galilee. It's a five-day walk. And he'd say, I want to show him something about the temple. Hey, guys, let's go for a walk. And he'd walk to Jerusalem five days. And he'd be like, you see that over there? Okay, yeah, all right. We can go home now. Oh, my goodness. But what he knew was it's not so much the experience, as important as that is, it's the walk. Can you imagine walking for five days with Jesus? And so if, to the degree you can get people out of their ordinary life, it will be much more effective, way over 50%. If you're talking about somebody who uh, you're, you're going to, you, you think maybe, and it's worth trying, 
I think you're going to be probably below 50%. I don't know because that's not the model we use. We use immersion events as the primary mode. Um, but I think it's powerful. And I think anything we can do to invite people, and again, we're kind of leaning and looking. We use the acronym FACT, F-A-C-T. Are, are they faithful? Are they available? Are they contagious? In other words, they're, they're, they're on fire about this, and are they teachable? Those are the people. Scott saw that in me when I was here and invested in me. Um, and, and so uh, you don't do this with everybody, and you don't do it with even the ones you want to right away necessarily. Do you have their trust? Uh, and, and so I think you could, by contextualizing it, the, the percentage goes way up. And so, but so I didn't answer your question. I'm going to guess it's lower. I'm going to say 20%. Without an, Without an immersion. Over 50%. I mean, we just literally, I mean, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, and, and it's not, it's, it's a four o'clock moment, but it's also, um, we, we have folks who are not involved with our program but come to, to a five day conference with us and discern their vocation. And we don't even count those people in our numbers because we didn't walk with them. But they're still having the experience because they're surrounded by people and they're like, oh my goodness, maybe this desire I have to be faithful isn't crazy. Because I think a lot of young people today who have faith are embarrassed by it. I know I've, I've met a young girl who said, I used to tell my roommates I was going to a party on Saturday night and I'd go to mass. But I didn't want to tell them because I was embarrassed. And to be able to sit back and say, actually, I've met some really awesome people who are also faithful is such a relief. I think for anybody of any age, but particularly for a young adult. Good enough? Good enough. Okay. Fantastic. Yes, Father. Yes. Right. Yes. So why don't we say only five percent of the Catholics go to church? So for the, the, for the recording, uh, why don't we, if, if crisis can lead to greatness, can create this the space where greatness can be? We mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. and Jesus as two individuals in history who who were born into crisis and were great. Um, I would, I would actually argue absolutely we ought to. It strikes me that, that there's a prayer that every priest and every religious prays every day called Liturgy of the Hours. And in the Liturgy of the Hours, most of the prayer are the Psalms. And the Psalms, I just literally, I've been doing Lexio in the Psalms for the last six months. I literally just finished last week. The Psalms are overwhelming because over and over and over again, David and the other psalmists pray something like this. Not every Psalm, there are, but, but probably more than any other theme is, Lord, my enemies have surrounded me. I am devastated. I am trapped. You, O oh Lord, must deliver me, and I trust in you. And, and they pray that every day, and then they walk into their first meeting going, it's so hard, and the church is falling apart. Oh, my goodness. This is precisely when we ought to be jumping into his arms saying, you and only you, Lord, can fix this. I'm all in. Because here's the deal of us being with God. We are like a pen or a pencil or a paintbrush in his hand. He's the artist. We deserve no credit whatsoever. In fact, the only way we can collaborate with him is if we give of ourselves. When the pencil has some of its lead rubbed off, then it's being of use. But it doesn't deserve any credit for what's written, but it participates in God's creative power when it gives of itself. We should be stepping forward in God's life and say, I got nothing, but everything I have is yours. Use me. I'm willing, to, I'm willing to suffer for this. I love talking to our missionaries. We got about 800 of them, and I love talking to them, and, they'll, and they'll, I meet them in tears. How's it going? It's horrible. I mean, I, I feel like I'm making no progress with the students I'm working with. It's, it's, it's terrible. Do you want to quit? No, I'm here. Do you want to move? No, I'm here. And, and, and then the, and the stories happen over time. This one guy came to me and said, I got this guy, he's a superstar, he's going to be awesome. I think maybe he'll become a missionary. I want you to meet him. And I, I showed up for the meeting, the guy didn't show. And, uh, and I didn't hear anything about it. I went back home, where I was in a different city, this, the missionary was, and uh, I talked to him about three months later, and I said, so Greg, how's the things going with that guy? And he goes, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that question. He, um, he actually not only didn't show up for the meeting with you, he's blown off everything he hasn't gone to a single Bible study. He hasn't met with me. He won't take my calls. Actually, the chaplain on campus met him and said, hey, long time no see. Why don't you give me your phone number? And he gave him the wrong phone number. 
And he goes, I, I just, I'm such a failure. And uh, he said, I was, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you the story. And then I talked to Greg about uh, five months later. And I said, Greg, how you doing? And he goes, you know, I got to tell you the, sec- the last chapter of this book. About three weeks ago, knock on the Newman Center door. And uh, the priest opens the door. And, he's, and the guy says, the same guy says, I've been running for almost a year. God's called me to the priesthood. And I'm in. And uh, Good Friday didn't look good on Good Friday. Um, it doesn't look good right now. But Jesus Christ did not save the world with his amazing teachings, and they are amazing. And he did not save the world with his amazing healings, and they are amazing. He saved us by suffering and dying for us. And if you think we've got another way, there's no other way except to spend ourselves and trust to him. And so I'm all in. We should pray the Psalms, whether it's in the Psalter and and, and the Liturgy of the Hours, as a religious and a priest and bishops do, or whether it's just Lexio, as I just did, and just sit back and say, Almost half of them, I don't know how many, more than 50 of the 150 are written by David. Um, and he was a man after God's own heart. And to be able to sit back and say, we need men and women after God's own heart. So I'm all in. And I actually think that telling young people today that there is a crisis and that there's, they have a role to play. And if they don't play it, there's no backup plan. There's only, God created you to be you. There's no, there's no other you. And if you decide to play video games and get addicted to pornography, that stuff that was supposed to happen is not going to happen. Because you talk to young people, they're like, I'm not hurting anybody. Are you kidding me? If you were a fireman and the alarm went off and you were playing video games and you said, I'm not hurting anybody, you would lose your job and you might go to jail. Of course you're hurting somebody. You have a specific task. And when young people hear this, they're like, really? Show me how to live that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the third book, which I didn't mention, uh, that I brought was uh, the one that I wrote a few years ago called Made for More. They were made for more. And to live for less. Um, the Pope Benedict, on his first mass as Pope, I, I was with my wife. We were, we were doing this very difficult um, mis- missionary work uh, in Hawaii. And, um, and, and so we happened to be in Hawaii when this was going on. And... Uh, if I were watching the Pope preach, and he, he uh, in his homily said, and, and to you young people, so I, you know, I run an apostle for young people, I lean forward, he said, the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. I was like, oh, that's gold. And we've tried to share that with people. Um, anybody who's in love realizes it's never enough. I, I cannot love my wife enough. I certainly can't love God enough. I, I mean, it's... I don't know how you do on that. When I, when I, I don't always use the Ten Commandments as the examination of conscience before confession. I can't get past the first one. I mean, it's just, it's, it's an, I'm an abject failure. All my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength. Okay, and by the way, everything else I'm going to confess is because I'm not doing this one well. Um, so th- I got a big problem with the first commandment. And so what do you say good enough if, if the, none of us can get past the first commandment? And to be able to recognize, can we set the bar higher? Because we live in a world that says, it's okay as long as I don't hurt anybody. As long as we don't mean, you know, abortion or divorce. I mean, those things have to be tolerated. But because but, we're hurting a lot of people in our culture. And the point of that is that can't be the goal. That can't be the target. And we're supposed to actually set things right. Jesus actually was living the good life as the son in heaven. And he left that to come here to fix stuff. And, and the goal of, of Catholicism is not to get to heaven. If that were the case, Jesus would not have founded the church. He was already in heaven. The goal is to get as many other people to go to heaven as possible. And for that, it's not enough to do the corporal works of mercy. We have to do the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. Because even if you house somebody, they won't need that house 100 years from now. Even if you feed somebody, and we ought to house them, we ought to feed them, they'll still be hungry tomorrow. But if you can can win their souls for Christ, they'll live forever. So the spiritual works of mercy are frequently second in, in, in priority because we have to feed them and care for them first. You can't evangelize a starving person. But they're never second in significance. The spiritual works of mercy are far more significant because it affects the soul which lives forever. And the only chance the body has of living forever is if it's attached to a soul that's going to live forever. I 
think we are. We got time for one more. Yes, two more. Well, I'll be quick. Sure. I do think sometimes it's important to take a step back before you take five steps forward, and I, but I don't know your circumstances well enough to answer. What I would say is my experience is that Jesus wants to be adored, and it's easier to do so in a group. Uh, it, 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 there's horror stories of people coming in for, at the 2 a.m. hour, and then the 3 a.m. person doesn't show up, and the 4 a.m. person doesn't show up, the 5 a.m., you know, I'm not going to do that again. I just spent six hours, and I, I was late for work. All kinds of stuff. Whereas when you build momentum, it's great. Our experience has been... We committed to the holy hour. It wasn't 24-7 and focused right away. But the, church, the churches weren't always open, so literally weren't open. We would hold holy hours on the front porch of the church. We know you're in there. And within six months, the doors would be open. In one of our, par- one of our campuses, there, the Eucharist was in a, uh, a closet, in the ta- and the tabernacle looked like a, a college refrigerator, a little mini refrigerator. It might have been, I don't know. And, um, and, and there was no room to sit in the, where the, the Eucharist was. And so, but our staff started coming, and, and they, would, they would sit outside the, the, the door, and they were told, don't do that. Okay. So they would walk by, and they would genuflect, and they were said, don't do that. So they walk by, and they'd make the sign of the cross, and they'd say, don't do that. And then walk by, and they'd go, and make an act of adoration by a simple nod, and that was subtle enough that they didn't get in trouble for it. But within a year and a half, the, the tabernacle was back behind the altar and in the center, and, and adoration was begun. Jesus wants to be adored. We have to go first. And so building momentum is great, but you don't necessarily have to stop the 24-7. You could still start one hour a week where people gather, and it would be a time to invite people. And then you can tell them about, hey, we're trying to keep watch with them. Yep. Yeah. Might be time to start again with different events. It's, it can be when you're losing momentum. Momentum is very, very important here. Um, and so I, I, I'm, it's, I need to more, know more detail. I'd be happy to talk to you about it in greater detail to, before I could give any counsel. But that might be the case. Yes, and then we're done. Sure. What, what would be the advice to give someone that's like, say, my parents' age or a little older to kind of inspire, uh, I guess, young adults or, you know, the... Sure. Well, since they're not here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I think you should do, because um, you're here. Uh, when, I, when I first came back to the Catholic Church, I started going to weekday mass. Literally, it was me and 27 90-year-old women uh, and, and one priest. And... Um, <laughs> And these, they were wonderful women, and, and they were sweet, but it wasn't like we were going to hang out, you know. And, um, and, and back, I came back in 1985. I mean, Scott Hahn hadn't come to the, into the Catholic Church. Carl Keaton hadn't written Catholicism, Fundamentalism. There was nothing. I literally would read the Church Fathers and the Saints, and I'm like, this is it. And then I look around going, nope, doesn't exist now. And, um, and when one of the people that was closest to me in, a, in age, but it was still dead for a long time, was Cardinal Newman, who's going to be uh, canonized in October. And I, I was like, oh, my goodness, this guy did it. But still, nobody I've ever met has actually done this, become Catholic. And, I, I'm, and the, the only ones who are are dinosaurs. So I just started begging God. I felt like the first salmon to ever swim upstream. Like, I'm a sea creature. Why would I ever swim up a river? And, um, but I had this draw. I said, Lord, you got to give me a companion. I, so go to Mass every day. For the first six months, I wasn't receiving communion. I hadn't come back yet, but I was pretty sure I was on my way. And, and, and then after I started receiving communion, it's like, you got to give me somebody to walk with. I need somebody. And, um, and I'd stay for a half hour after every Mass and pray, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to be true to you. I'm so sorry I turned my back on you. I'm in for the rest of my life. you got to give me a companion. And after about six more months, one time, I looked over at the sign of peace, and there was a 23-year-old guy on the other side of the church. And we became best friends. He followed me one year later and got his graduate degree one year later than I did here. And uh, we were partners in, in ministry for our apostolate for years. You know, God parents one of those kids, and two became four, became eight, became 70. It just started to explode. Don't, don't wait for God to act. 
beg him to ask over and over again. That widow in Luke who continued just to harass the judge until he gave it. He says, I don't fear God, but this woman's driving me crazy. <laughs> and, 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 and Jesus says, I want you to pray like that. And I don't think we pray like that. You know, do we weep because we don't have what we need to follow him? Um, and, and so to be able to have that sense, we, we, he, wants to, he broke his heart for us. He wants us to imitate him and have broken hearts for what we're doing. I want to thank you for weathering the heat and the distance. I know you've got some place to go, but I'm very grateful for my time together. Let's close in a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we love you and want to love you. We want people to come to faith in you and to be with you forever as we pray together. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much.